God be in my head, in my heart, in my understanding. So for us, today is the beginning of the season of creation. However, in the season that is observed by many different types of Christian churches throughout the world, the season actually starts on September 1 and then goes through <laughs> October 4. <coughs> because we did Labor Day and when focus on that on the first Sunday in September. We started it today. <coughs> we we'll go through after St. Francis Day, which is October 6th. Uh, and there will be different things that happen. This whole bulletin, the booklet that you have is focused on creation. The prayers are prayers that are approved for the Episcopal Church's use from various supplemental material. Uh, and it focuses our attention on the whole of creation. And I think in a little bit of an interest of the way God does synergy, uh, I was drawn to this sun sign that I put on, on the outside. And lo and behold, <laughs> that's exactly what, what, uh, what Candace was talking about as, as she introduced the song to you. It starts with the energy of the sun. The energy of the sun is the energy of the earth as the energy of God. God, the created energy, is the energy of all life in the whole universe. So today is the beginning of that season. And in this year of 2024, the theme for the season worldwide, worldwide, the wild maybe too, uh, <laughs> is actually stated in the form of a goal. And it is this, and I quote, to hope and to act with creation, to hope and to act <clears throat> with creation. The goal comes at a time when many of us are beginning to realize that there exists a real fear for the future of this planet Earth, what one prayer calls our island home. And that fear extends on all levels, social levels, environmental levels, political levels, individual survival levels, and the survival of all that is a part of this magnificent planet Earth. Sometimes, as we see some of the things that have happened, uh, hurricanes, fires, shootings, all of these have to do with disruption and creation. And sometimes it begins to feel like we are just poised, that the Earth family is just poised on the edge of chaos. But in this season of creation, what we need to remember <clears throat> is that very frequently it is right at the edge of chaos that creation begins. In fact, the whole story of creation, the cosmic story told in chapter one of the book of Genesis, begins with the energy of the spirit on the edge of chaos as the spirit hovers over the dark waters of chaos. And from that flares forth the energy of God into the universe. Described in one way in Genesis, but in another way in our physical descriptions, and yet the two are not at odds with each other. Both start with a big bang. <laughs> Both start with energy. An energy that invites creation to bring forth life. This morning, our first reading came from the words of the prophet Isaiah. Actually, there's several Isaiahs in Isaiah, but all of the prophets Isaiah as truth to speak to the people. <clears throat> this Isaiah's words go out to a people who at that time in their lives also found themselves on the edge of chaos with a great fear for the future of their own world. And it is to that people, right in the midst of their fear for their future, that the prophet Isaiah speaks a word of hope this morning. A word of hope 
which in its own way is also a call to action. Because of hope without action is dead hope. And action without hope is fearful. Every time I hear this passage that we read this morning from Isaiah, the eyes of the blind shall be open, the deaf shall hear. Every time I hear it, I think it was a song that when I was a young um, Christian education and youth worker, deacon, and then later priest, uh, we used to sing that a particular song that had those words in it at the diocesan retreats, youth retreats, we called Happenings. And at those times, happenings happened in church basements and church uh, uh, undercrofts where diocesan youth from all over the place would, would gather. Uh, a very diverse group of young people. And they didn't know each other, a lot of them, when they came. But at those retreats, one song that became kind of almost a theme song in the years that I was working with those groups was a song written by Tim Whipple that was called Make Us a Family, Make Us Your Family, Make Us Your Family. And the lyrics paraphrase that the passage we read this morning from Isaiah. The first verse and the chorus go like this. And I tell you what, if I hadn't had this sing, this, this cold all week and I'm just getting over it, I wouldn't have sung it with my guitar like I used to do. But I just was, I just was not up to it. I couldn't get through it without going into a coughing fit. So, <laughs> so I decided I would, I'll, I'll bring it back and, we'll, and we will do it some Sunday and maybe some Sunday during the season of creation. We'll see. I can, we can get the words out to you and you can yeah. do it. But the, the first verse and the chorus go like this. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall hear. The chains of the lame shall be broken. Streams will flow in deserts of fear. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Now that we are your daughters and sons, let the prayers of our hearts daily be, God, make us your family. God, make us your family. Mm -hmm. I remember those closing <laughs> services. Each time we did it at a different church, whatever church had put us up for that, that weekend. And the church, those closing services would be filled with all the youth who had been there all weekend. All the staff, some known and some what we call hidden staff, who provided things but were never seen until the last service. And all the parents and clergy from the, from the various churches represented and families represented, and it would fill whatever church that was. In some churches that were small, it was standing room only, and in others, even as big as they were, it felt, it felt full. And when that song would happen, and we would sing that song, and there were usually kids that kind of made up a little praise band to accompany it, accompany it, it was like the roof had been raised. It was an experience that I remember because it spoke also to the experience of the of the whole weekend because really by the end of that weekend all of these people who didn't know each other youth and adult leaders we did feel like a family yeah. God had made us a family and I was blessed to be part of that experience because I know that even to today, many of those kids who no longer go to church still keep up with their happenings, their first happenings people. And some of them went on to be on staff themselves. As important as that experience was, however, I think that as we stand at the edge of chaos today, hoping for streams to flow into our own deserts of fear, we need to open our eyes to what kind of family God wants to make of us. What kind of family God wants to make of us. And as many people begin to ask that question, the voices of the spiritual wisdom that's inherent in many indigenous religions, non-Christian, and then brought over into Christian, but in both the indigenous Native American spirituality, 
certainly has this term I'm going to bring up. So did the indigenous Celtic spirituality. So does many of the African, even though it's not the same words, many of the African indigenous spiritualities. The same sense that in all of these spiritual traditions from which we eventually emerge, the understanding of a whole earth family, mm -hmm. that the whole family is the family of earth, and that God's family is always of the whole family of earth. Mm -hmm. It's often spoken of as all our relations. All our relations. And certainly the all in all our relations includes all people of every race and creed, of every religious and non-religious belief, of every economic status, of every political strain, Certainly it is that whole family that in the letter of James, we are encouraged not to show favoritism to the ones that we think are the best in that. Either way, really, he's concerned in that way because of, of how people are reacting to poor and rich people. But we have our own favorites, do we not? <laughs> the all in all our relations has to do with going beyond embracing a diversity of people. Because sometimes in humankind, one of the ways we show favoritism is that the only life we consider worthwhile is human life. And all the rest of it is just the stage we walk on. But that's not true. In the eyes of the God of all creation, for, for almost 14 million years, humans didn't come on till the very last paragraph of the very last volume of that story. <clears throat> the family of God, the whole family of Earth, is the entirety of all creation. And the Earth family, this earth family, that cries out for humankind to recognize that we are a part of that. Mm -hmm. We are not something favorite over here. And this is just there for us to do what we want to do. That phrase, all our relations, means we are kin to everything that is. The whole family of earth includes not only the non-human creatures that we see, like the animals that we love to have as pets and bless on St. Francis Day, but it includes the wild animals. It includes every form of vegetable life. It includes all the minerals and the rocks, the entire geosphere that was first before us to be born into creation. Vegetation of every kind, cosmic bodies of every kind, earth and sky and sea, and the elements of air and water without which we would not have any life on this earth. These are our kin. These are our relations. And when we say that we are to pay attention to all in the whole family of earth, all really does mean all. God seeks to make us a family that recognizes this incredible breadth, diversity, and grace of an ever-evolving, self-creating creation in which God and creation work together, as Genesis says, to let be. God invites, the energy of God invites creation to let be, calls forth on the oceans to bring forth creatures or the heavens to bring forth creatures. And then creation, without any help from humankind, responds. And we see all through that story that all of our brothers and sisters in creation respond, providing what God has asked for them to provide. And then finally we get to the humans, 
the most complex and most conscious creatures, because we are creatures along with all creatures in the family of Earth. And we have also the greatest freedom, with which comes the greatest responsibility. And as the story of Genesis tells us, we have so much that we can be considered even in the image of God. And that's why God, in that story, gives a vocation to humankind. And the vocation is to govern the creation. Not, that's what the dominion meant in that language. Not to just do what we please with it for our own good. But to govern it in a way that leads to the well-being and the flourishing of all. St. <clears throat> Francis understood this. One of his many, many prayers and songs, well, this one sometimes called Candle of the Sun, sometimes called Praise of the Creatures. Be praised, my Lord, through all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun, who brings the day and you give light through him, and he is beautiful and radiant in all his splendor. Of you, most high, he bears your likeness. That's the sun's vocation. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars and heaven. You form them clear and precious and beautiful, their vocation. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, which is very useful and humble and precious and originally chaste. <laughs> the water's vocation. Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Fire's vocation. All creation shows glory and praise by living into their vocation. The book of Daniel, a song called A uh, Song of Creation, says that. Let the earth glorify the Lord. And then it goes through all the same kind of things. Glorify the Lord, mountains and hills and springs of water and seas and whales and all that move in the waters and birds of the air. Glorify the Lord. And how do they glorify the Lord? They glorify by responding with a yes to the vocation that God has given them. And they are what they were created to be. Glory to God, O beasts of the wild and flocks and herds. And then glory to God. Glorify the Lord, O men and women everywhere. Glorify the Lord. <clears throat> and how do we do that? By living into our vocation. In the season of creation, I hope that we won't just celebrate it in church, but that we will take the sense of it with us day by day. That we might hope and act and pay attention to trying to hope and act with creation in ways that glorify God by living into the vocation God gave us to tend to creation. And so as often happens, I began with a little bit of synergy between Candace and me, and a little bit of synergy in my morning prayers, which I do every morning from this book, Celtic Benediction, and nearly skipped this morning because I was in a hurry, but something told me not to <laughs> Here's a prayer for all of us in the season of creation. I watched this morning for the light that the darkness has not overcome. I watched for the fire that was in the beginning and that burned still in the brilliance of the rising sun. I watch for the glow of life that gleams in the growing earth and glistens in sea and sky. I watch for your light, O oh God, in the eyes of every living creature and in the ever living flame of my own soul. If the grace of seeing were mine this day, I would glimpse you in all that lives. Grant me the grace of seeing this day. 
grant us the grace of seeing. May it be so. Amen.